going from the last one that turned in. And then there's a new one out, right? Right? So I'm looking at what Paul put, because I am Paul's, uh, I guess, decipher of what Paul wants. And if you remember, there were two two things that make up diversity. What, what are the two things that made up diversity from the other lecture? Richness and evenness. So when I'm reading these three things, I don't see anything about evenness, right? Because he's asking for richness. So to do evenness, you'd have to do those transforms, right? To transform one way to get the zeros back. So essentially, in this homework, you shouldn't have to do a proc transform. So if you're doing a proc transform to do this homework, then you've made it you know, 10 times harder for yourself. Does that make sense? Because all you're, all you're calculating is the richness. And the diversity. The, that's the richness and abundance. So abundance is how many of each, right? But you, uh, we're not, you're not transforming. Okay. So it, it's the homework should be a whole lot easier than you than you know, at first you're thinking, oh, I got to do all this stuff from that other lecture. So you don't have to do that. This is from the lecture previous, where we basically just did the means, and you're able to grab those two items, uh, the the count the, and then the means. Yeah. Yesterday or in class that we verbally said we calculated the diversity index. That's the only reason uh, I was assuming that we had to do that. No, I, I really don't think that, because then he would say, let's just says it's N1. So is, is N1 N prime? Is that what he's, what he's was saying off of that? Because that's not J just, prime, that's not H prime. He would specify. Well, he said pick one, so we don't have to calculate. No, he said, well, he said use N1, but that's based on H prime. So you've got both. Okay. Yeah. How about, how about I will call him and then I will tell him to send the email to class to specify. Because I read it being you don't have to do that because he would say you need to do a proc transform if you had to do the proc transform method. So I, I'll call and verify that because I don't think it's that hard. The, the other thing is, is that actually because I did the diversity lesson, and I came, because he said, do the diversity lesson, I did the diversity lesson, and he came back and said, oh, actually, we're not supposed to do that until after spring break. So, but that's the one he told me to do. So I, I, I cannot believe that he's gonna want you to do all that crazy stuff with hills and all that, that we did with the arrays. I just cannot believe he's gonna want you to do that. I'm, I'm thinking it's just, richness and abundance, which was one was count and the one was means. That, that's it. Okay. But I will, I'll call him later and clarify it for you. Because I was there too, I didn't, I, I took it as being richness and abundance. Yeah, that's a lot less work, like a lot less work. All right, uh, I actually really like this lecture. This is the lecture on ANOVAs, one-way ANOVAs and transformations. Uh, I really like it because after taking four or five stats classes where you talk again and again about an ANOVA, in this, in this lecture we're actually applying it to real data. And reality never goes quite right compared to general theory in a stats class. Because it seems to always work out perfectly when you do it in a stats class on some canned thing of, you know, five values. But when you have ecological data, nothing works like you want it to work because your values are so weird. You know, you've got, you, you do a count and you, you get either a value of 0 0.01 or a value of 1,000. And then you're trying to evaluate these things together. So what this lecture is, we're going to be talking about the assumptions 
of ANOVA and making sure that the assumptions that we take when we do the ANOVA are all going to be there. And then how to correct these issues when we find out later we do our test and that it didn't work because we violated one of these assumptions. Um, so just a refresher, you know, what an ANOVA is, right? We're comparing means between different groups um, to determine if there's a significant difference between them, right? And if it's significant, then we say, okay, we accept that alternative hypothesis, which is at least two groups are significantly different from each other. This is kind of a bread and butter stats. We do this all the time. Um, and the example, again, is going to be that NAS1 data set because we did this treatment by stations. And, uh, and we want to see in this lecture, is there actually a difference between these stations? This, and we do this kind of work all the time. You know, is there a difference between what we're looking at? So here's the assumptions. And this is coming from Paul's uh, chapter book that he put out. And I got to say, if you read those two chapters that he said to read, this stuff will become really, really clear because he's very, very clear in what he means by each of these. Um, so the first one is these inference assumptions. Um, and the first one is, are, are they drawn from a normally distributed population? ANOVA only works on a normally distributed population. Okay, So that's one of the, the big problems. And the, the issue, though, is that you can't just look at your data set to see, is it normal just looking by the set? Because if it's not in groups or subgroups, then it might be shifted to one side or the other just by the way the numbers fall on the chart. And so I'll show you that later. So what, the way that we find out if our population is normally distributed is actually by looking at the residuals of after we do the test. Um, so part two is our observations, random samples from the population. This should be handled by your experimental design. So you should, you know, we should know that we're, we're doing our tests randomly. Um, and then A3 is the variance estimates are homogenous. Uh, all, in other words, are the samples estimates of the sample population variance. So this is a, a problem of not enough samples. So if we didn't take enough samples and say that the populations we're getting from can be anywhere from a value of five to a value of a thousand, and we only take two samples out of that, we're not going to be able to capture that homogeneity. So if we don't have enough samples, then, then we break assumption A3. This is the kind of the second largest item that we have. Um, and then are the sample variances independent? Is there a null hypothesis? Again, that's just part of your experimental design. Um, so the next set is these model assumptions. And with the one-way ANOVA, it's really hard to mess this up anyway, because there's not really much to the set. Um, you know, the set that we have for the NAS only has one date. It has number of stations and replicate. So, you know, we want to reflect the sum of all the sources of variation that reflect that outcome. And if you, if you do your ANOVA wrong, so say that that we did it by date instead of by station, then you would be measuring something completely different. And this is, this is one of the largest issues that you're going to have when you start getting into two-way designs and start to get into multiple sample dates. But right now, it's pretty easy. We can't really mess it up. Um, and for one, the experiment contains all the treatment levels, and then all those error effects are independent of each other. Okay, so it's a, it's a random variability. And this next lecture, when we get into the two-way designs, Paul's going to get into some extreme detail about how to actually formulate this model and where particularly these errors and things come from. So for right now, you know, with what we're going to do today, we've got the part easy. We've got the model done. It's, it's, it's not hard. Okay, so our errors. And does anybody remember what a type 2 error is or a type 1 error. Remember that stuff from stats? So there's the false positive and false negative, right? So one of them is a false positive and one's a false negative. Um, so the issue that we're going to have 
if you violate one of these assumptions is, you know, you could have either one, but typically what happens if your data isn't normal or you didn't take too many samples is actually you have a false negative. What there really was a difference in these means, but we were now able to detect it because we didn't take enough samples or our experimental design was wrong. So that's actually the most common one that you end up having, and that's why we're going to do the transformations. All right. So this is, again, you know, this is definitely review, right? A normal distribution, right? Um, do you know off the top of your head what the central limit theorem is? Like, just off the top of your head. Because I, I can almost virtually, well, maybe 80 or 90% of the time when you go into a doctoral defense and you're in the middle of defending whatever research you have, then you have a math guy that's going to ask you that just right then. And if you don't have the answer on the top of your head like, like that, then you're going to not feel so smart. So there's one of those things like these basic, um, basic things you've got to have down. All right. So does anybody know it right now? I mean, this is this is like a stats 101 thing. Isn't that something with like if you have a large enough amount of values that they can be more distributed, but even regardless of any other line. Yeah, I mean that that's the the basic theory is if you have enough samples, it should look like this. It, it, it and you're and you're capturing that variance. You know, you're not. Um, let's see. We go back to. So as long as your observations are random samples, right, that you're not cherry picking where you're going, things should fall toward a normal distribution, right? So it should be that way. So if we violate these assumptions um, and normality is the problem of we need to look at our residuals, the observed versus the predicted. And when you run the test, it's going to say, well, this is what we predicted it is. And then we're going to look at that residual, and that residual is what's going to tell us what the normality is. Um, but in general, that in general, the ANOVA test is actually pretty good when it comes to having a non-normal set. And so the best is to really always look at it. Even, even if you get a right answer and you say, oh yeah, there is a, a difference there, you should really always look at your residuals just to verify with yourself that this is what you're getting. Um, the, the other biggest problem that people have is, well, we don't have a random sample uh, or our model isn't stated correctly, um, or our variances just aren't homogeneous. And if we have, it, depending, if we don't take enough samples, those problems get magnified. So, it, but then, you know, the, the statistician would just say, we'll take more samples. But for things that we do, taking samples is not a cheap process, right? I mean, I don't, pretty much no matter what what group you're working in. Um, I mean, like in Stunz's group, taking out the big boat, like how much does it take out? It costs to take out the big boat on one trip. Yeah. So it's, and that's, that's minus people costs, material costs. Um, you know, and, and even for us, it's really surprising just to take a tiny boat out on the bay for one day, you're looking in the thousands of dollars just for people, time, gas, everything. So taking more samples is not is is not something you want to just do willy nilly. You need to actually completely know that oh yeah we do need to take some more samples, right? Okay. So again, worst offenders model correctness, the random sampling, uh, homogeneity, and then your normality. But if you take enough samples, normality is usually not a problem. Okay. So even even if if you have these variances that are huge, you know, huge variances between your, like, replicates. Say, you like, you, you know, a bunch of them that have 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and the other ones are thousands. Well, if you take enough of them, 
it, you will still get a normal distribution, right? You just have to take enough. But then that question becomes, well, how much money am I willing to spend to do that and, uh, and to get it there? Um, and so we say, well, you know, we might be able to do these transform properties in order to save us some money down the line because we don't have to take all these, right? Okay. So what we're going to do in SAS first is we're going to do the one-way ANOVA on the, the NAS1 set. And this is just the proc summary. This is from Paul's last class. I just did a proc summary. And is there a significant difference between station needs? So I'm just looking at it, and you know, this mean is definitely very different than the other ones, and the standard deviation is pretty small. So I kind of have a hypothesis. Maybe station station D station 1000 might be different just from looking at it, but we need to run the ANOVA to be sure, right? So let's take the code, all right? And now, again, at the end of the class, I'm going to put the code on the, um, not the, the blackboard, on the blackboard. All right, so I need to do my library. So I do this every time for me. All right, so I have my library. Okay. And the first thing that I really like to do is make a copy of the set I'm working with to work, so that way if I mess it up, I don't mess up my good copy, okay? So I'm gonna just copy it straight right now. And we're gonna copy the this um, composite data set that we had from the other lecture. Okay. So I'm going to copy that to work. Okay. So that's all this statement does, right? So I'm, I'm with the data, we have to do the set, and that's where it's coming from, this is where it's going. So I'm going to copy that. So now if I go up to my work, now I should have that copy there. So now I can not worry about messing up. Is, is it big enough? I can make that bigger. Is that big enough that people can read it? Yeah. In the back? Yeah? OK. All right. So now let's run the ANOVA test. So we do proc. GLM. And we need to give it a class. What class are we going to give it? Station. So what, what are we trying to test? The differences between what? We're trying to test, yeah, the differences between stations. So we want to do the class as station. And we're going to have to give it a model statement. And what I'm going to do is, is we're going to test the n. We're going to use this variable. This is, this is how I always find out. Like he, he did this thing yesterday. And you go to a, your view, and you can change this view to just have, I don't know what I did. You can change your view to just and instead of seeing the labels, you see what it is. But I just right click it and go to attributes. And that tells me the name, the label, and then the format. So I'm looking at just number of individuals. Okay. I think something I executed something weird. But, OK. So I'm going to model in equals station. So this is the very, very most basic ANOVA test. All right. I hope I didn't mess something up. I don't know what I clicked to get 
hex coming out. Okay. okay. So our distribution of them, and it prints out the probability of the difference. So according to this ANOVA, is there a significant, a statistically significant difference between these stations? Well, there's a difference. It's at the point one level. You could probably write a paper on that, but if we're going, if our alpha level is 0.05, then, then there's not, right? So we, we can't say within the alpha level of 0.05 that there is a statistically significant difference between stations right now at this test because our, then our probability should be 0.05 or lower. So according to this ANOVA, it's not, right? So if you, if you don't wanna have to read the stats, and because there's the stats right here, if you, if you really don't want to have to read the F value and the P value, um, something I really like doing is doing the, the Tukey test. And it's, it's a pretty nice item. Here, I'll show you this. Let's go back and we'll say mean station. And we're going to take the means and I'm going to say Tukey lines. That's it. And instead, when we run this, everybody got that? So we run this, we don't get, we don't get a crazy graphs or anything. So we say, so our alpha level is 0.05, that's just the standard, SAS the standard alpha level, because that's stat standard. And means, with the same letter are not significantly different. So apparently it says the grouping is all in group A. And so group A is not significantly different. So instead of reading a bunch of numbers, you can just run the two key test and you can get a visual. They're all in the same group. I really like doing this because you don't have to look at the graph and look at the graph. Because when you start looking at those graphs sometimes, yet you looked at it before, and I do this too, and I go like, gee, it looks a whole lot like this station's not really part of these. You know, and you start, you start kind of cherry picking through your data to try to find some relationship that might not really be there. And yeah, there's a relationship there at the point one level, but that's not statistically significant. And if you start reporting that in publications, then reviewers are gonna come back and be like, yeah, you, you need a backpedal on this. You need to say maybe there's something there, but obviously you didn't take enough samples, so there's really nothing there, right? So that, it, you get in a bad situation when you start doing that. So when you look at this, then that's for sure there's nothing there. Okay. Well, so did we look at any assumptions in our data at all? We haven't looked at any of the assumptions. We assumed that our model was good. This kind of, it's kind of not hard to mess that one up with the very simple, with this set. So let's just say we assumed this was all correct, okay? So are our observations drawn from a normally distributed population? We don't know, we didn't test that, right? Um, our samples from the population, we did a good, our, our experiment we think was good, the way we did replicates, the way we designed it. So we thought that was good. Uh, are the variances homogenous? And so we don't know three either. So we need to go test these to be able to sure did we actually do our assumptions correct, okay? So let's go back and the, how we're gonna do that is we're gonna look at the residuals. Um, I don't know if he, did, I forgot if he did this yesterday or not. Did he, did he print out a residuals? And the way you do this is you have these keywords output out, because now we're going to make another set, and I'm going to give it a name, and it doesn't really matter what the name is. 
And again, this residual, the name of the variable, you could you could name it anything you want, but you'll quickly get yourself into some weird situations if you name it something really off, um, then you don't know what you're talking about. So typically when I get stuff and Paul gets stuff, you just say residual of the name, so like put an R in front of it, so you know that's the residual number. Because if you started calling that one in, you could you could totally make that set with, and it puts the residual in a label in, but then you wouldn't know what you're looking at, right? Okay, so let's run this now, because now we're gonna make this set. So, and it should tell us the same, it'll give us the same thing, but now, we're going to have a residual set, okay? And now this residual set, we're going to use and proc me a variable. And we're going to do a normality test and plot it. So I'm going to give this a whole lot of crazy keywords and we'll go through kind of what they all mean. Essentially the keywords just add more and more stuff to it, more and more analysis. So I gotta say what variable I want to look at in that set and this variable rn, right? Variable we did. And uh, I'm actually gonna label it so I know what I'm talking about. And I'm going to do a histogram. And I'm going to get fancy and I'm going to color things. See, I, I typed something wrong because this is black. And now it's blue. Go down a little bit so I Well, like gray, normal test, and the normal test is going to have estimated mu, estimated sigma, and one with black. set the mean and standard deviation of it. I'll show you what all this does if you don't have an end. Plot, plot. And the probability plot. We're going to test for normality. Again, mu. Estimated mu and sigma. I actually think when I do this, it's easier to do it with everything in it and then cut things out and you can see what that cut out. It's a little bit easier to visualize it. Um, but each one of these is going to produce a line or an equation that's going to overlay on top of the other graph to help us see what we're looking at. Okay. So hopefully it's like, I got everything in here, right? Okay. So we're going to print out a bunch of stuff. started off with. Okay, residual core. And so the probability plot and the residuals. So just looking at the residuals, um, this should this is the observed versus predicted. And other than this guy right here that's above, almost all of this is below. And Essentially, when you look like that, then I, I kind of, and this is from Paul's lecture from yesterday, 
it doesn't look like a normally distributed. It, it should be this line when I look to look at it. This is, this is again, this is plotting the residuals. So 